untie it. Now, here we go for the first time. There's that beauty. This is the blue one, the M205. I've always been curious about this pen. In fact, one of our pen members has one this size. And I was able to use it at the pen club meeting because I was always wondering, would this pen be too small? Well, if I was to write with it like this, it would be a bit small. I have small hands. But when you unscrew this magnificent fountain pen and you post it, which posts securely, then you have yourself a beautiful fountain pen that fits well in the hand. And I will be doing a review on it. Here it is, folks. There it is. This is the Mont Blanc. The Beatles. The Special Edition. So, I'm going to leave it just like it sits. And we'll be back soon to film the opening of the beetle box on a whole different presentation setting something that's going to be fit for such a magnificent pen the beetles is and always has been my favorite group in the entire world i love rock and roll that's true and you know i love all the rock and roll bands american british australian i love them all they rock but when this band, uh, band came out I was riding my bike and had my transistor radio on, AM, and I saw her standing there, came on. Then I want to hold your hand. And then right there, for some reason, it just kind of grabbed me and pulled me in. And I knew this was my band. Everybody has different opinions, and that's cool, and they like different bands, and that's cool. But this is my different band, my favorite band, excuse me. So, don't misunderstand me. I love the Beach Boys and the Stones, Chuck Berry, you know, Roy Orbison, Presley, uh, the Kinks, the British Invasion, the Bee Gees. But this is where my heart lays right here. If you can understand music, appreciate rock and roll, or whatever type of music you're digging, then you can understand me. Here it is. See you soon. But don't forget to stay tuned to this channel. And it will be up very soon. Thanks for watching. Later. Hey folks, Larry here from Larry's Fountain Pen and here's Kevin. And we are at the famous Fountain Pen Revolution store. So, Here's what we got going on here. In Plano, Texas, Kevin finally has opened up his shop. So I'm taking it you're living the dream. Living the dream. Yep, so here we go. So for those who live around the surrounding areas might want to come out and check the new pin shop out because, hey, we got one in our own backyard now, so let's use it up because I'm sure Kevin would mind it. Would I, wouldn't mind, I wouldn't mind it all. So look over here what he's got. He's got some diamond inks now. Besides his own brand, so got a whole lot of diamond, all kinds of flavors, and some uh, Kaweco, and some other cool stuff. We've got Jay Urban coming next week, and Jay. then we'll have uh, Organic Studios also. Oh, cool. So you all heard that? Organic and Jay Urban. And look over here. Got a little bit of everything going on, and uh, believe it or not, I use these. So that's a good one. So... And let's come over here. Here is the, I guess, the heart of the pen shop. The fountain pens. Now look at that. Wow. Those are some good looking pens. Look at that one. There's just like the USA there. 
And then look up here. Got some nice looking pens. And they are affordable, I would say. You're going to get a really fine nib. And for the money, you can't beat it. And I did a video uh, the other day on Kevin's nibs. And I showed you how his uh, Super Ultra Flex steel nib broke. Now that was dynamite. And not just I, but there's another reviewer that has claimed the same thing that that nib writes just as good or even better than some of the name brand high-end pens that you get. So that's a good thing. And the nib is affordable. So here we go back over here. Give a shot over here and then let's go over here to the counter. So they got to give this man some business. I know I will in a minute. He'll take all my money. So <laughs> he's waiting like a spider with a net. Pink. <laughs> Bring out your heart, Larry, then leave. Okay, here we go. You know, I don't use uh, eyedroppers because I just never have because I like to change my ink out a whole yeah, lot. I'm with him. But they're nice looking. I like the size of these eyedroppers. Look at the size of them. Well, they're still making some of them with Schmidt inserts. So these have a. Uh it's the same size pen, but you've got the converter, the Schmidt converter, wow. nib unit option. Look <clears throat> at this sucker! Wow! Beautiful! Now this is a good looking pen. Look at that! That is among us beautiful! And you don't need a cap because it would kind of look a little bit strange. Yeah, they, but they're a little big for my hand. I have kind of small hands. I have small hands, but still, man, good looking fountain pens. Let's see if some mothers you got here. Uh, how about that, that teal looking one? That, uh, the bottom or the top? This one? Uh, yeah, yeah, that one, yeah, yeah. Is that as big as the other? That's the same pen. Same size. <clears throat> Look at this one. Now, these are handmade, so there's a little bit of variance from batch to batch. <clears throat> and obviously, I need to put a nib in that one. Yeah. So, this one, the body might be a little bit bigger. Beautiful. Look because at there's that. There's a little bit of variance back Yeah, a little bit. <clears throat> but yeah, he, he will put nibs in them, so don't freak out on me. Beautiful pen. Now, tell us a little bit, Kevin, who makes these pens? Uh, tell us, <clears throat> do you have any hands-on on the pens or? On our uh, FPR line, I do. Basically, I have parts manufactured uh, almost exclusively in India. And they'll send us one guy, I'll make the bodies. Another manufacturer makes the nibs, another manufacturer makes the feeds, and they send them to us, and we put them together and heat set them and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the pins over here on this side, these are other brands. So the Airmail uh, brand down there at the bottom, that's out of uh, Mumbai or Bombay, India. This is Guider. Uh, he still makes everything by hand, hand turns all of his pins, and he's in uh, southern India. Makes these pins and these pins, and then <clears throat> Camlin, that's sort of the famous Indian brand. Uh, so we don't manufacture anything over here. Over here, we do a lot of hands-on. We don't actually turn anything, but we do a lot of assembly. Okay. But, okay. you know, the Himalaya pens that have become pretty popular, you know, one company. Lee Green from Robert Oster, which you guys know. I was uh, Rob's first U.S. dealer. I started with him in 2016 with 36 colors. He's got well over 20 U.S. dealers alone now. And uh, I debuted at the 2016 uh, DC Pen Show, and it took a chance on me because I was only in a year in retail. Hello, Wayne. Most popular pen brand uh, has generally been Lamy or Pilot. Uh, in recent months, because of our lockdown, it's kind of like a hodgepodge. There's a little bit of everything. But at pen shows, definitely Pilot and Lamy moves, and so does a lot of my unique stuff. Like uh, Opus 88, uh, Magna Carta, Constellations 88, stuff that I am actually the only U.S. dealer of, and things like that. So, yeah. If I had to pick, it's easy for me, If I had because I got like five of them. If I had to pick one pen, it would have to be Franklin Christoph's Pocket 66 posted. That Good feels choice. better. In my hand, I don't have big hands. But I can write with it all day. It feels, that's what this whole thing's about. What works for you? Same thing when I teach scuba diving. What works for you? It might not work for me. I can't tell you how your shoes feel on your feet. They look all right, but I can't tell you. But that's the pen I would choose. It would be Franklin Christoph Pocket 66. 
I have to write with the post-it, but I do yeah. it all day. Uh, someone asks, uh, what is your favorite ink to use for drawing? And uh, also curious, uh, what size nibs do you use for drawing? I use all size nibs and small artist paint brushes. Um, my favorite ink, if I had to pick one, would probably be Mont Blanc. Just because the cleanup, it's real fountain pen friendly. And I can use it in inexpensive pens and very expensive pens. Uh, what medium do you draw on? Is it a, a regular art canvas or something else? No, well, I, I do anything. My favorite, which is I have more control over, is uh, Bristol paper or Bristol board. Like, um, here's Marilyn Monroe on Bristol board, Bristol paper, oh, okay. just white. I don't know if that's showing up clear or not. Yeah. I've got some weather. Um, but no, I've used, I got everything. Uh, Tumway River, watercolor paper, if it's not too absorbent. Uh, I've ridden on the back of sharks before. Ooh. And um, I was working on the Atosha with Mel Fisher, and I had a dive partner, Jack, and we were blowing holes, which are craters under the water. And visibility was zero. Anytime you stir up the bottom, visibility goes to zero. And law of the jungle is little fish come in and big fish come in. And I was, my dive buddy was Jack. He was over there somewhere. I couldn't see him. And I felt something tap on my shoulder. And I knew it was Jack. He tapped on my shoulder again. And I turned around and looked, and it was a six-foot stingray. Mm -hmm. And he was looking for something to rub on. I always wear gloves. And I just rubbed between his eyes. It seemed like five minutes. probably wasn't that long. And he just swam off. <laughs> that was it. But no, I mean, it, it's like dogs, you know, you, you, um, if you go around a lot of dogs, there's always one that's aggressive. And if sharks or anything's aggressive, get out of the water, but just go slow. Don't panic. But for the most part, they've never seen a human. They're just curious. I've swam with whales, sharks, you name it, barracuda, you name it. Can you hear me, guys? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, look, just wanted to comment on a couple of things. A minute or so ago, you were talking about Parker 51s. You were talking about vintage more recently. Um, I'm just sitting here at the desk, and I just thought I'd show you this. Um, this little pen here, um, just to give you an idea of size, that's a Stressman 805. Okay. Um, this is a swan, I think, or a blackbird, which is a subsidiary swan, and it's engraved FC Brown, I think, 22-8-1914. So that's over 100 years old. Wow. First, first World War vintage. Um, now, really old pens have got what they call an over and under feed. I don't know if you can see that. But there's a feet underneath. There's also a feet on the yeah. Um, yeah, I see it. So, yeah, a lot of people don't really get it. It's uh, an eyedropper, which I can take or leave, to be honest with you. Um, but, um, yeah, since you're talking about vintage pens, I just wanted to uh, show that, that feed. Because and uh, what is the reason for the double feed like that? Well, I, I don't know, Larry. Um, all I can suggest is it's a very early pen um, before it evolved to a fountain pen as we know it. It's sort of halfway between a, a dip pen and a, a fountain pen. Um, when you look at the inside of the section, there's in there, you can't really see it, but there's a, a bit of coiled wire that's a feed. Okay. Sometimes that wire comes out an inch or so. Um, but I, I think there was this thought that, you know, you, you feed ink to the top and the bottom of the nib. And um, it's a very, very fine, very soft, flexible nib. Um, almost. Yeah, very, I see it. It's pretty. I um, like it. Yeah, 
and it still writes, it still goes. I don't use it much. Do you use it a lot? Very few, very rarely. Um, like a lot of eye droppers, it um, burps and blobs a little bit. Um, but by and large, it still works fine. Oh, How does okay. the overfeed compare to a hooded nib? Do they work very similarly? Same, same principle. Yeah, it just it just keeps the, the nib wet from both sides so that it prevents it from drying out. <clears throat> okay, we've got a couple of questions coming in on the chat. One for Larry. Uh, is there a curtain pen that you've never been able to review that you would love to have? Okay, I'm going to need some help from the pen geeks on this one. All right, here we go. Now here's the pen that blows me away, and I'm going to say it wrong. A, a pen that I, before I die, I have to have it in my hands I, and just, just, to die over it is the LB5, and is that what it is? Yeah. I've heard, I hear they're high dollar. Uh, I, I, I don't know what high dollar is at 2,000, 5,000, but I hear all the great things about it. That's the one that my sights are set on. Hey, folks, Larry here at the Dallas Pin Show. Check out cool stuff. We just bought uh, some pin cases over here. And this is the lovely lady that we bought our pin cases. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Rima, and I work for Mario Kappa from Toys from the Attic. And we have great cases, we have great pens. Look for us on the web of Toys from the Attic. And I just got and we're back to Kevin's table. Howdy, Larry. Kevin, we're trying to find He's the guy that does all the magic, right? He makes all these great looking pens. And here is this famous blue storm. That one's a roller blade. Huh? That one's a roller blade. Oh, no, I'm just saying. Oh. Yeah. And let me show you some different ones over here. I'm digging this clip. Look at this clip. Look at that. That's bad, ain't it? That's bad. Look, look at this, though. Jim made these clips. Isn't that right? Didn't Jim make the clips? Jim made the clips. That material. Oh, yeah. That's why he didn't make them. Well, no, he didn't make the clips. I made them. No. No, they, they come from a guy at Fort Worth. His name's Larry. He's very artistic. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's a great engraver. You remember? Yeah, you remember his thing? Yeah. We learned a couple things from him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But this is my well pen, though. And you'll find out later why it's my yeah, I, know, I know we've chatted a couple okay. of times on the show. that red one. That clip he did make. Now look at this one. This clip he did make. Now that's bad, ain't it? Really, really bad. Just check it out. You want it, hey? Yeah, I want that. Save me some. You want that, don't you? Well, get on down to the pin show. Open up your bill for the big man to take your money. Yeah. Say credit card too. Yeah, they're not bashful. I don't know if they can give you a donut. For some reason, uh, a lot of people have started coming in more and more now. So here we go. And if, for all you Lumbee lovers, right here. All you Lumbee. You want a Lumbee kid? They got a Lumbee kid. Right over here, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Here we are, Retro 51. All right. I'm going to get one pin and two weeks. Well, listen, I just want to first thank you, uh, Larry, for allowing me to come on your channel. Uh, and, and, you know, for all those people that haven't subscribed to you yet, they need to do that because 
you know, about four years ago, I started in the fountain pens. I had never owned one. I'm, I'm an old dude now and never had. I always thought about it, but I said, no, nah, I've always loved to write. So about four years ago, I, I got into this this hobby and I started going online. You know, that's how I started off. You know, Brian Goulet video. I said, I'm going to get myself a fountain pen. He says, oh, so I got a fountain pen. I messed it all up because I didn't watch what you're not supposed to do. I put calligraphy ink in a fountain pen. I messed it up. <laughs> but but I, I said, I'm going a, I'm to soldier on. And so I started watching these videos and I started pulling up these people that watch for pen reviews. And I pull up Matt Armstrong and, and SBRE Brown. And then I, there's this one channel called Larry, you know, Larry Baronis. And I, so, uh, so I pulled up this, this fountain pen and it was this, this, this gentleman sitting at his desk. He was all excited. He had his little, his little, he had his little deal. You know, he had this little deal and he a little blue and he's cutting his box open. And he says, I want you to check this out, check this out. And he, and I remember you pulling it out. And I remember I could tell how much Larry Baronis was in love with that pen that he pulled out, how much passion it gave you. Uh, this is a long time ago. This is four yeah. years ago. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you were just getting very first pens uh, that I would recall now. You were starting to really go into that rabbit hole. And I recall the, the passion and how much love you had for what you were pulling out of that box. And I, that was infectious because I couldn't stop watching. I thought, well, man, he gets his, and I, and I was feeling the same thing. You know, every time I'd get a pen, I'd get, I'd open it up and I think, oh man, this is it. This is it. And then there'll be another one come along and you know what happens. There. It's interesting because it isn't about the fanciness of the pen. It isn't about that high end pen. Ultimately, it all comes down to one thing and it's your love of writing. And it, and that's what these, all these pens do. Listen, check this out. Check this out. See, there's a, there's a Twisby Eco, yeah. $30. This is a Visconti Daedalus, which I don't want to even tell you how much that costs. But my point is, I already know. Both of those, both of those, both of those right. Yeah. They both do the same exact thing. You know, whether you're driving a Cadillac or whether you're driving a, you know, a yeah. entry level car, yeah. they're both going to get you from here to there. Um, so it is nice, but you know, if you want something bad enough, you'll find a way to put that money aside and get it. Yeah. And there is something to be said about having some variety. So you know what you like, uh, whether it be the steel nibs, gold nibs. I, I, why I got into fountain pens in the first place is I'm going to take you back to my childhood when I was a little kid and my mother would receive letters from Italy from her first cousin. They were like sisters. They were like sisters. <clears throat> Excuse me. And she would get these letters and I would open it. She would open them up and she'd say, look at, and it was in Italian. So she would read it and I could understand it. Then she would write her letters back. And I think that was kind of interesting. That's kind of cool. And then she would show me letters. I, in fact, I have them. I have a letter from my, my uncle, her brother, who was in the war in France in 1943. He was in the fields wow. writing this letter back to his parents, my grandparents and to my, his sister, my mother. And I have this letter. And my, my uncle passed away before my parents were even married. And, and that letter, this is, the, this is the power of a letter. That letter allowed me to know my uncle without ever meeting him. I knew about what made him sad, what he was happy about, what the war meant to him. And that letter is like a piece of history. It's, it's an archive. It's yeah. something that you can hold on to. Okay. So <clears throat> that, that I'll, I'm going to jump forward to about 1980 when I went to Italy with my family. We, I met all my relatives and I, uh, I said, you know what? I want to get to know them better. Well, you couldn't call long distance because it costs like an arm or leg back then. And I said, I'm going to start corresponding with these relatives. So I start corresponding. I start writing letters and they start writing me back. And I thought, this is really nice. I, I go out to the mailbox and get something in the mail. I thought it was pretty cool. And then, uh, and then jump forward again to uh, 1985. I'm on the road in a band playing music on the road. And uh, <clears throat> 1985, I had pre cell phones, pre cell phones. Um, you know, long distance calling was expensive. Uh, and to be on the road for 10 weeks or three months at a time playing music was great, but you miss home. Yeah. So I, I used to look forward to those times uh, when I would be in the hotel room and the light would start blinking on the phone 
and I call the front desk. They say, you have a letter at the front desk. Well, it was like it was like you, your family was with you. You know, it was it was a great feeling to have somebody that took the time out of their day to put you in their heart and in their mind and write something out and said, this is for you. I, you I've been thinking of you. Yeah. It's so very personal, very personal. Exactly. And and so, uh, you know, I've I've really jumped into the letter writing. And what better way to use your pens than writing a letter? I mean, uh, to get an email is great, but it's any, you know, it's so impersonal. Yeah. Uh, My first question to Jim is, what got you interested in making fountain pens? That's a long story. Um, so when I started woodworking in general, uh, it was flat work. I used to build furniture. And in fact, if you all give me a second. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to make old-fashioned wooden hand blanks. Oh. Um, so I used to teach people how to make them. Um, I used to teach a lot of different things. But I, I, was, I was doing a lot of flat work, and I belonged to a club up in Michigan um, called the Southeast Woodworkers Group. Uh, Southeast Woodworkers. Yeah. And every month, somebody would demo something, a new skill, something they were working on. And one of my friends uh, happened to be come in and say, okay, I'm going to show you how to turn a pen. And it was a little kit pen, slim line pen. And, uh, at the end of it, he's like, would anybody like to try? I've got a few extras. And I said, sure, let me give it a whirl. Now, bear in mind, I used to make fun of people that would spin wood in circles rather than cut and build and whatnot. And I, I had such a good time, I bought a lathe that night <laughs> and started adding that to, to what I did. And over time, um, I, I just became fascinated with it. And then probably 2013, 2014-ish, I had watched a video on YouTube, and it was uh, a whole series of videos, the, Jap the Masters of the Fountain Pen, and it was all the Japanese masters. Um, and one in particular from Hakusei Pens really struck a chord, and I'm, I'm watching the video, and I'm like, I'm going to teach myself how to do this. And from that minute on, everything I've done for the next couple of years was to prepare for what I'm doing now. Uh, and back then, there weren't a lot of people talking about it, teaching it. There weren't a lot of videos. It was kind of a trial and error thing. And, and not a lot of people were helpful in, in answering questions. So, but yeah, that's long story is, is how I got into it. Now. Jim, what is the hardest part to make an pen that you have found? Would it be? Well, I got two answers for it. So, if I'm making everything from scratch, it's a clip. I was going to say that. I, I don't enjoy clip making. Um, I, I make them. In fact, I've got a machine back here in the corner to mill. It helps me uh, do the rings, and shape the metal. I just, I like metal work. I'll make a lot of my own bands and, and decorations for pens, but clips sometimes can take me as long to make the clip as it does the pen. Um, for special pens and things like that, I'll do it, but for my everyday models or, or for what people want to spend anywhere from $150 to $200 on a pen with a steel nib, I can't make a clip cost effective for that style. So I will I will buy clips. Now I'll, I'll buy quality clips. Um, and and so far they've been well received. The other hard part, if you're just talking pen making in general, is making the same pen repetitively, making it identical. Um, a lot of what I do is handmade. I, I don't have machines programming. Right just to, to kick out the same dimensions every time, I, I gotta do it by hand. But and, and sometimes there's some slight variations. But that's what makes your pen so unique. They're, they're, they're not gonna be copies of each other. 
they're all going to have some slight difference. In yeah, life. and as much as I try, um, if I make two blue storms, there are going to be some minute differences. Mm -hmm. I might be the only one that picks up on them. I might be the only one to identify them, but there are two differences. But, you know, uh, that, that's really it. And coming up with new designs. All right, folks. I'm going to give you the first inside look on Jim. He's making me a pin. I picked out the color of the blank I wanted, and if you notice, he has to do the marking to get everything ready to go. He's got the sections going, so anything you'd like to add, Jim? Yeah, so what we're going to do, this will be hand threaded. He wants, essentially, this big girthy pen, but more along the lines of this sort of length. Or that sort of length. Or, well, they're about the same length. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, we're going to end up cutting a tenon on this one and running some threads. And then we're going to bore a hole in this and then run some threads and make sure everything fits up the way we expect. And then we'll work on the section, some shaping, and finally polishing. So we'll make this, Larry, so that we can uh, take somewhere between two and two and a half turns to open. It'll be it'll be less than what I normally do. First thing we're going to do is flatten the face out. Let's me know about how far we got to cut down to get to the right dimension. <laughs>
going to cut about five thousandths of an inch off. I've been to doing my favorite color, blue. Love blue. Because I love, you know, I, I like solid black, brown, red, orange, green. Even pink. Pink's hot. Give us a little room for when we're cutting. I noticed the smell. Does the odor ever get to you? Um, with this particular plastic, it does. Um, this is a, it's a, called acrylic acetate. So, celluloid or cellulose acetate will be very similar in smell. Um, Excuse me, real quick. Is this uh, the acetate you're using now? Is that the easiest material to work? Let's go ahead and get to the pin writing instrument. Right, yep, yeah, okay, make sure I was right. That is really sharp. I, I was impressed when I saw this new packaging. Yeah, I said, well, the guys up their game, and they have. And now let's look at this magnificent fountain pen. And I was looking for one of my pen wraps here, right here. Put that right there. Look at that. Twist off cap. Look at that. Really just a nice section right there. That will accommodate all size fingers. You have ample enough room. So again, right here we have this Birmingham fountain pen. Beetle use. Fully machined in-house, made in the USA. Hand polished. Comes with a ink converter. With a German nib size 6. And uh, it has the cap and barrel are threaded. And for those who are interested, 
the cap will pose securely and it fits fine in the hand so it may look kind of awkward because some people say that's kind of big it's up to the individual but it's big enough to use it without posting your pen going on here well here at inscription.com you know essentially what we're trying to do is bring back handwriting you know i find in my life people have gone to using these things for communication you know computers everybody wants to yeah like larry likes to do like you yeah. know keyboard heroing yeah, not so much pins real pins fountain pins paper real paper these are the things that people should be using i mean use your brain write a little bit more um i feel like you know larry he kind of sees it too and wants to keep it alive i mean fine writing is just it's not as prevalent as it used to be you know i'm i'm not gonna fib and i don't have a problem telling you i grew up catholic in the catholic church and writing all the time was something that you do um I learned how to use a calligraphy pen in school, use a fountain pen, you know, initially ballpoint pens or roller balls were, you know, wasn't, you know, a dip pen was something that I was familiar with walking into the, the headmaster, or the, the dean's office or whomever, you know, and using that on their desk. Uh, sorry for bad trying to right. show you a dip, but, um, it's just things that I think we, we were taking for granted, you know, and as education's changed, you know, generationally, I find that writing and all together is just, they don't really do it. Even with my own children, you know, I have a nine and a six year old and different school districts and writing is just not something they do as much as they probably should. I would like to do kind of what a lot of these brands are, are talking about, uh, buy, the products that are warranty here in the United States. I know that's, that's hard to do these days and that kind of, I'm getting off track and talking about the pins, but for me, that's a big thing. I don't want to send something to Japan and have to deal with two day next day and, you know, wait and wait and wait. At least here you have someone that's willing to support the product here in the States and you can send it to them. I could, if there's a problem with it for you, um, and get a new one or get something better, but. This is how to get in touch with Federalist Pens. And Frank is the guy there. He runs the place. You got it? Get to know Frank. Great guy. Friendly guy. He's there to serve his customers. He will go the extra thousand miles to meet your needs. Okay? He's just a great guy. Very cool. So, here's a notebook that I bought from Frank. And uh, it's the Endless Recorder. Okay? And they say it's the uh, world's most ink-friendly notebook. So, it has a 68 GSM Tombo River paper. My favorite paper. So, it's got... Uh, Let's say it has zero bleed through. And here I've already been writing in the notebook, as you can plainly see. And it does really well with the ink. And I've laid it down pretty thick. On this one, I use a 1.5 stub with that Noodler's El Lawrence ink, and I really laid it down. And it did a great job. Great paper. On here, I, I used the Lamy Joy uh, Calligraphy 1.5 stub, the Robert Oster uh, Gold Antiqua 
again, it did a fine job of holding that ink together there. Great job. Nice notebook. It's got a little bit of different feel uh, on the paper than the 58 GSMs, but still a very nice paper to write on. And I do like the ribbon. I can use that to mark my pages where I'm going to be. Uh, so, what else about this notebook? It's got the rule page layout. It comes with 187 pages, 16 perforated sheets, a table of contents, and we'll go to that right now, table of contents right here, and I've already been marking some information in there for me. Uh, it's got that expendable uh, inner pocket in the back, which I've shown before. It comes in kind of handy. And I just mentioned the page marker, the ribbon, so that's cool. And it's an 8x5. Really just some nice paper. A nice notebook. A great notebook. And um, really I forgot what I paid for it, but it, 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 it wasn't all that much. Uh, it was very affordable. Uh, um. We actually had it. We had an armed robber in the store, and uh, Dave and I fought him off with uh, a label gun. Um, the police are now looking for a man with a price on his head. Whoa! Uh, How about this? Oh yeah, those are good looking ones. Go ahead. Yeah, you know the the purple is uh, is kind of on short supply. Um, in fact, they've only they're only down to a couple of nib sizes now. I really like that one. The blue, I think, is hot, too. Yeah, blue is hot, too. Yeah, purple and blue is hot. Yeah. Yeah. But you put them all together with the orange and the, the green is cool. That cherry blossom. So the Ecos, uh, those are always fun. Uh, these Penlux. No. Now, what is that one? So this is the, the, the Penlux Masterpiece Grande. Um, yeah. It's it's a 149 size pen, king of pen size pen. Uh, they're piston fillers. They use a uh, Yovo steel nib, okay. and they, they have a little roller clip. Really nice, nice construction piston fillers, and they're under 200 bucks. That looks sweet. No, they just really... I like that one, too. Toy is great, yeah. isn't it? And it's, it's translucent, and you can see through. You can see the actual piston mechanism right. inside of these. Do it in a blue. Oh, that's gorgeous. Look at that one. Dang. Yeah, and these are number six nibs too, so you can pull them. They don't they don't twist out. They're just friction fit. Yeah. Bit. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have something else, you know, you can you, you know one point five, you got some kind of custom, you can uh, you can put it in there. Hello, this is Mr. Announcer. We want to introduce you to the very special people who work at Stride Inc. delivering Schneider pens and other products to the U.S. They have a unique line of useful products and take pride in the work that they do. Excellent. Well, thank you, Larry, and thank you, Mr. Announcer. We're really excited to be here today. Um, this is our first ever virtual tour. We've not done it before, and I think we've got some of the hiccups worked out now. Um, we do we do love having people come by Stride and to see what we do. Um, our business is a nationally and internationally recognized for the integrated employment of adults with special needs. And that's very important. Integrated employment means that we are for profit. We bring people in, we pay them real wages for real jobs, and they even get paid time off in the same retirement plan I do as CEO. So um, it is a mission of, of love, it's um, our heart and soul. My mother started our company in 1981. So next year will be our 40th year. Wow. Um, and remarkably, um, when you did your first review, you got you read Maria's, Marie's story. Marie has actually been with us since 1981. Wow. And another employee, Peter, who is on the autism spectrum, he started in 1981 as well. Unfortunately, 
good good half of our special needs people are not currently here because their caretakers have decided to keep them home a little bit longer through COVID. So we have a kind of a shortened crew. We are an essential business, so we were allowed to stay open as part of the supply chain. Um, and we, we did ask our special needs people to go home to protect themselves. They did. And um, as they felt comfortable, we've asked them to come back because we miss them. They do a lot of work here. So, um, but we're really excited about this. Uh, you know, I said that our, our mission is to employ people with special needs. We do this by selling office products. So the core portion of our business is we are the exclusive agent for a company called Schneider um, out of Germany. So every time a Schneider pen is sold in the U.S., it comes through Albuquerque, New Mexico, where special needs adults have hands-on work. They may hand assemble, they package, they repackage, they label the products, and they ship them out. So your customers, if you're buying Schneider, do know that you're, you're helping create jobs for special needs people. Um, and that's, that's a great part of our business. Some of our customer base is um, Office Depot, carries a, a small portion of our line. Um, we, you can get our pins through Staples. You can get them through ver every office products dealer in the United States because we're placed with two national wholesalers. Um, but truly the best customer and the widest assortment of Schneider pins is through Amazon. Cool. Amazon, yeah, Amazon buys our products direct from us. They warehouse it in their stores. So we're part of Amazon Prime. And then we have our own shop on Amazon that you can reach through Amazon slash shops slash Stride Inc. A lot of S's in there. Um, and that's where we put the, the pretty much everything. So a lot of the pins that you got, Larry, that you reviewed, Office Depot doesn't have them or Staples doesn't have them, but they are available on Amazon. And then the other core part of our business is all the other locally owned internet dealers. They they buy a lot of Schneider pins and sell them um, either by a box or by the each. So. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Just in time for our next 10 videos. Come on in. Let's go. Hello folks, welcome back to Larry's Fountain Pens. I'm Larry. Today I'm going to review the Lombi Fake Fountain Pen. Uh, for especially a lot of the newbies or just people in general that aren't aware of it, which I'm sure the majority of you are. Uh, there's all kind of fakes running around nowadays. Uh, and so if you're not too familiar with fountain pens, or even if you are, sometimes it can get by you because they're made to look exactly like the original fountain pen is. Uh, so, on on my venture with fountain pens, I found this out by watching other reviews and I did some exploring and experimenting along the way. And I'll tell you a little bit about my journey. I'm not going to give any writing samples, nothing like that. I'm just going to talk a little bit about the different pens and the fake pen. I'm going to show you some pins down here now. And as you can see, the, the Lamy pins. And uh, when you get a Lamy, as you well know, they come in the Lamy box. Can you tell me which of these pins are the fakes? Which of these pins? Okay. Is it the turquoise? Is it the purple, the black, or the one purple in the plastic? And I'll turn that around and make them all... Which one is it? Which one is it? Because one of them or more could be it. Now, these in here are brand new. That's why you still see the little cardboard uh, still intact. I, I haven't use this pen yet and I'm not going to use it and on this pen it's still intact just like I received it and I'm not gonna use it I'll explain further in a few minutes these Lamy's I have used and they come in a box like this this one came in a Lamy box as well and here's your Lamy 
So we want to make sure we're on the same page. Lamy. Lamy. As well as this one. Lamy. You can see that maybe. I don't know if you can or not. But I'll get a close-up shot later with the lens on it. And here is a fake. This is a hero with a fine nib. And this is how I received it. I ordered this from AliExpress from China. And I paid something like eight bucks for it. Uh, I knew it wasn't real, but I just wanted it as a souvenir to remind me. Just to say, hey, I really got a fake. How cool is that? And it even says hero on the side of the pen as you can as you can tell it there so but it has everything the Lamy has everything identical even the windows if Labor Day is a holiday why am I doing all this extra work 